Stygian, will you try? <laughs> Originally released fall of 1992, I'm thinking September-ish. It was developed and published by New World Computing for DOS and uh, would receive a couple minor ports to the Japanese-based FM Towns and NEC PC 9801, but certainly most known for the DOS version featured here. The fourth game in the Might and Magic franchise, Might and Magic Clouds of Zine, the title screen actually doing away with the Roman numerals, in which they would later get back to, so it's kind of odd that it's not actually titled Might and Magic 4. But uh, I have actually done a review already of My Magic 3 Isles of Terror, and I did that for the Amiga. You can check that one out in the annotation thingy or in the descriptions and such. And it's based off the same game engine as Might and Magic 3 was, but uh, definitely they improved quite a bit on the engine here, and they definitely get a lot more of the graphic department and put in tons more animation. And also, as you can hear, added sound uh, where appropriate. I think there is a version out there, an all CD version, which has nothing but uh, audio, uh, digital audio for the voices, but I don't have that version. So mine features just uh, certain scenes with the uh, voice acting, which I, I prefer, especially for these reviews. Because it's, it's not impossible, it's definitely more difficult uh, to uh, be talking over a bunch of people. Now the main game screen comes up as World of Zine, and that is because I have both Might and Magic 4 and Might and Magic 5 installed into the uh, same hard drive, which will combine the two into World of Zine. Uh, Might and Magic 4 was created with the idea in mind that the two games would go together at some point. This is uh, a version, I guess uh, Sonic was doing it. I, I think this came out before Sonic uh, the Hedgehog did it. Uh, so actually it's the first, probably the first game ever to feature that kind of a uh, lock-on kind of a uh, thing where they're both combined. You go in between the two. So it's actually more impressive uh, than uh, Sonic 3 slash Sonic and Knuckles was. Uh, nevertheless, I will be simply reviewing and showing you my Magic 4. I'm just going to stay on the Clouds of Zine side of the world, and we will later cover my Magic 5 and the combined world of Zine at a later date. The game features uh, two difficulty settings, uh, Adventure and Warrior. I never actually understood though that. That's, it seems like an awful way to describe difficulty settings, rather than just easy or hard or whatever. To say Adventurer and Warrior, I don't see how the two are practically the same in my mind. I chose a warrior for this uh, playthrough, which is the more difficult setting. It's actually the normal setting. It's how the game was built, and I think at the last minute they uh, chucked in an easy mode for people. So uh, easy mode, all it does is uh, change the hit points, I believe, to your enemies, so they're going to be a lot easier for you to kill. I don't believe it has any other effect other than that. Uh, we're now in character creation mode. The yeah, absolutely essential part of uh, any RPG, you can, you can spend over an hour uh, creating your characters. Thankfully, the uh, dice rolls, they allow you to uh, change stats between them. So if you get a 12 on Might, and you're doing a Knight, but you have an 18 or something on Intelligence, you can switch those two attributes, just like in Might and Magic 3, a fantastic way for a role-playing game to operate, uh, you know, Might Magic, they always had, because they are not bound by the rules of a TSR and stuff, they're just emulating that, they can definitely get away with uh, making the game as best it can be on a computer platform, and they don't have to worry about following the letter of the law like the Gold Box games would do. So say hello to my party shot me, the knight. Uh, Paladin is a D Forte. We got an, uh, I believe, uh, archer slash um, a sorcerer kind of thing. Uh, he is Jakku Gamer. Kate slash Esper Dreams is our robber. Uh, Stygian Phoenix is our cleric. And Peckbilly is our sorcerer. 
I'll check the description for links to all of these uh, friends of the channel. I love them all, so check them out. Now, despite the impressive for the time uh, introduction animation with voice acting, well, the best, uh, the best story in a role-playing game, especially for the introductions and such, is almost always in the game manual. So let's look at the game manual. This is Six Mirror. You and a small circle of friends have gathered at a local tavern in Vertigo to discuss the events of the last several months. Your conversation bobs and weaves among subjects in between draughts of ale, but the central topic is the vivid, recurring dreams you all shared starting eight months ago. The first dream, a ride as a nightmare, frightening in its clarity and intensity. You all dreamt that you were listening to King Burlock's advisor, Crodo, speak to you. It was as though he was talking from a great distance, and the message seemed to have been addressed to someone else. The message is not a dream. I am sorry to trouble your sleep in this manner, but I have no way to communicate with you. A few months ago, a man claiming to be King Burlock's lost brother, Roland, arrived in court and announced himself to the king. Roland had left on a mission into Mount Firestone many years ago, looking for the passage of the fabled land below the land. That Roland should return home after all these years was very good news for the king, but I have my reservations. Where had he been all this time, and why hadn't he come sooner? Suspicious of him from the start, I watched him tell tales of ancient treasures and works of power. The artifact that Roland talked most about was the Sixth Mirror. The Sixth Mirror was the only magic mirror that was made to be portable, and because of this, it had no name. The owner of the mirror was able to step through it, just like the other five mirrors, but he could take this one with him. That Roland was upset with the mirror became increasingly clear with time, but the king did not seem to notice. Rather, King Burlock began to finance expeditions to find the lost mirror. Many brave and powerful adventurers answered the call, but none succeeded. In spite of repeated failures, Roland urged the king to continue the search. As the search grew more feverish, King Burlock began to neglect his management of the realm. The king's health deteriorated, the servants grew lax in their duties, and the treasury ran dangerously low. I felt that I had to do something and do it soon. I resolved to sleep on it and speak to the king in the morning. To my horror, I saw Roland sitting cross-legged, holding a black tome in one hand. From a charcoal diagram on the floor rose the image of a foul spirit in the shape of a knight with horns cresting his helm. Roland was conversing with it in a harsh tongue that I did not understand. I must have made some sound then, for Roland abruptly turned and stared hard at the door. I backed away from the keyhole immediately, and it was well that I did, for the door suddenly blew off its hinges and slammed against the opposite wall. Fearing for my life, I ran. I ran as fast as my old bones would take me. Ran as though the forces of hell were at my heels. In despair, I turned to face Roland and raised my magical defenses, knowing that he was stronger than I. Roland came charging around the corner and slowed down when he saw that I was cornered, raising his hands above his head in preparation of a sorcerer's strike. Roland smiled and said, What's the matter, Crodo? Are you afraid of what you saw? Roland continued to approach me slowly. Feeble old man, your fear of magic you don't understand is a discredit to our profession. Caught off guard, Roland failed to deflect the spell. The blades flew out from my hands, stripping the flesh from his body. Hope rose within me when I saw what I had done to him, and despair when he still stood after the attack. Scraps of flesh clung to his grinning skull, and his one remaining eye glared at me. I knew then that Roland was undead, and that I could not defeat him. Who are you, I gasped, staring at the figure before me. Lord Zine, the monster said. Call me Lord Zine, King of the World, for that is what I shall be in a very short time. King Burlock, I began, will do as he is told. Zine finished for me, especially if he doesn't have you around to give him bad advice. There was nothing more to be said. Zine made a peculiar gesture with his right hand and then clenched his fist. I felt a pressure on my defenses and my head, which quickly grew intolerable. The blackness took me, and I knew no more. When I awoke, I found myself in a tower on an island surrounded by water. From my window, I am able to see King Burlock's castle across the water. Every day, I see the search parties leaving the castle to look for the mirror and wonder if the king knows what Roland is or where I am. There is only one place in the world with a view like I have. And that is Baron Darzog's tower. Because of the materials used to construct the room I am in, I am unable to use my magic to escape. The only thing I can do is try to send these dreams to you in hopes that you will hear and respond. I don't know what Lord Zine wants the mirror for, but it can't be good. I fear the ruin of the realm if he succeeds. You are the only people in the world with the power and resources to make a weapon capable of slaying Lord Zine in your laboratories in Newcastle. You must make haste. If Lord Zine discovers what you are doing, he will destroy you with that. 
The dream ends. This dream had been repeated several times for about two months, then never again. The day after you had your last dream, Newcastle was destroyed by a bolt from the sky, and all its inhabitants were killed. Each one of you realized that you may be the only person left, alive, who received the message. If you didn't do anything, nobody would. So you quit your jobs and traveled to Vertigo with your life savings. Here you were able to find the training and spells and weapons, and here you met one another. You talk late in the night, excitement and nervousness in your voices as the conversation winds down, and you are all getting ready to retire for the night, and you agree that tomorrow is the day you will start your adventures. Whew, what a story that was. Yeah, I was getting ready to uh, start thinking that maybe the game itself you know, might not have had the greatest uh, story in terms of Might Magic games in relation to the other ones. But then I read all that, I'm like, wow, no, 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 I, I, always, I forget about that. <laughs> you, you read that story and you are instantly, you want to play the game instantly once you uh, start uh, reading that. Now, the story itself in-game is probably amongst the weaker Might and Magic titles in terms of story, which in all of these Western CRPGs are kind of, they're weaker on the uh, story elements. You usually don't get much of it in the beginning or middle of the game. It's not in, even until the middle of the game that you get on board with the main, you know, storyline at all. You don't even hear about the main storyline until you know, more towards the middle of most CRPGs. Uh, you know, it's not like a JRPG in that sense. But usually the story that you do get towards the middle and end is extraordinarily memorable and strong. This is probably amongst the weaker in terms of that. There just aren't... There isn't that much story in this one, and I think it's just because it's meant to link with Might and Magic 5, and Might and Magic 5 fills in a lot of that story that this one is lacking. But what it uh, doesn't have in overall you know, far-reaching story, it has much more. It's probably the best game in terms of a CRPG and the small stories, the side-questing stories. We are now fighting a bunch of dwarves, which we have learned from the mayor of Vertigo that uh, the dwarves, uh, there have been some uh, clan of the dwarves have gone kind of mad and uh, have taken over the uh, red dwarf mines. We are fighting a king, actually, one of the many, many uh, bosses that are in this game. Uh, probably you know, a fantastic game in this range. Has a lot more bosses than uh, Might Magic 3 did. So we had to search all these mines, which are many mines, and then you had to get some codes and to type in the code in order to get to this area with the Clan King here. And the great thing about Might and Magic games is that you are required to use both your Might and your Magic. There is no way we could have beaten this battle with just hitting the attack button. We had to go into our spellcasters range and use their spells and at the same time just the spellcasters would not have won that battle. We needed a combination of both of these attributes. One of the major major issues with quite a few role-playing games JRPG and CRPG is that you don't once you, you just don't need both. You can get along. You can uh, you can get along with just one or the other usually in these games. You usually get a buff fighter, and that spells the end of everything you meet consistently in this game. Throughout it, you will be required to use both your might and your magic. Fantastic! Uh, all RPGs should require that. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's some weird playthroughs out there of this game where you just have an entire party of knights or paladins or sorcerers or whatever, and they probably manage to get through the game. But a, a balanced party like this, which is the best way to play the game, that it's going to require both might and magic. I really appreciate that from all the might and magic uh, games. Uh, combat end of it all, it's not the best in terms of the combat, but it's not at all out of place in this uh, genre by any means, okay? 
you know, wizardry and Bart's Tale. You know, tons of games had this type of perspective where you had the 3D perspective, and then you encounter enemies, and then you know you're put into a, a text-based kind of a menu. Although you can use your mouse in this game too, but you know you hit A to attack, or you hit C to cast a spell, or B to block. You know, it's tons of games went with this style. You know, it's not as good as the gold box games were in terms of combat. But that's just one facet of things in terms of the overall games. I've always enjoyed the Might and Magic games overall more than I've enjoyed the gold box games. And I love the gold box. I love both of them. But I've, you know, slightly more enjoyment towards the Might and Magic series overall. Mostly because of its uh, story and uh, just the slow building of everybody into that godlike uh, status that you get at the end of the games. Love, I uh, just love that journey that uh, these games push you through. Headwitch, another boss battle that we are facing. Another, she is going to destroy us this first time, and you always get so much enjoyment out of you know finding these bosses and getting slaughtered by them the first time, probably. But then, you know, you, you strategically think in your mind, you know, even though you're hitting A or casting spells, there are many strategic things. Like, in order to get to her, I'm pretty sure I teleported or something in order just to face her alone with not her friends. And I probably used a well to get a few more hit points. You know, it's there are tons of strategic elements in a game like this. And there's also, like puzzles as well. You know how to get out? The witch is taking me over this place, and I know that the, one of the doors needs a password to get through. He lowers his voice and whispers, It's Rosebud. Uh, tons of fourth wall breaking in these Might and Magic games. Uh, generally, they are amongst the better kind of fourth wall breaking and that they will leave you with a smile. There's just a million references. Uh, not particularly in this game, but a lot of the other games have tons of Star Trek references in particular. Uh, John Van Kenham definitely was a big Star Trek fan. But there's tons of other little things like there, like Rosebud, I mean, obviously. We're referencing Citizen Kane there, and I just, I love that they chose something like that, which will get a smile on most uh, people who are familiar with film. I'll put up a smile on your face versus just some random weird password that can that you struggle to even pronounce because they gotta have some weird fantastical you know, lore to them, which a lot of role-playing games went to. You can't even pronounce half the names in a lot of role-playing games. It's not like it's some different language or something. It's English and you can't pronounce it. I think that's a failure in story writing. You can have unique names, but you don't have to make them unpronounceable. But how about we start our annual look at the thoughts of the time period by looking at Compute Magazine, May of 1993. DOS and T, the final DOS. Do-it-yourself Windows, three great tools, lets you create your own apps. Might Magic Clouds of Zine, bigger, brighter, and bolder than ever, New World Computing's latest flight of fantasy is so charismatic that it nearly jumps off the screen from the opening credits with a cleverly parody of MGM's Leo the Lion to the rogues gallery at Games End. Designer John Van Canaham displays the confidence of an artist at the top of his form. Canaham utilizes the same dynamic front end of his previous hit, Might Magic 3. Might Magic Clazazine may well be the perfect role-playing interface, detailed yet streamlined and colorfully intuitive. The main display window is amongst the largest in the genre, pulling players into this 3D fantasy world. The game world is huge. Five towns, nine mines, three towers, three cloud worlds, four castles, five dungeons, three caverns, and 24 unique outdoor areas. The game's open-ended design encourages spontaneous exploration, allowing you to branch off on dozens of mini-quests. Although most have nothing directly to do with your main objective, these subplots earn characters experience and rewards while adding flavor and variety. The game also contains built-in links to the dark side of Zine, a forthcoming sequel. The only shortcoming worth mentioning is the rather rudimentary nature of your quest. Role players itching to solve complex puzzles might be disappointed by the combat intensive plot. On the other hand, hardcore hack and slashes will revel in the melees that grow more intense with every turn. Nearly perfect in design and execution, might and magic, clouds of zine is one fantasy you'll wish would never end. Scott A. May. 
IBM, PC or compatible, 2 megabyte RAM, VGA, hard drive, mouse optional, sports Sound Blaster, Sound Blaster Pro, AdLib, Sound Blaster 2, Pro Audio Spectrum, and Disney Sound Source. Also sports the Roland MT32, 69.95. Back to compute in January of 1994, they are going to uh, look at the best games of the previous year, 1993. And they start off the role-playing section with a very nice uh, little uh, text about role-playing games. Role-playing games, by nature, are unquestionably the most personal of all entertainment genres. After all, the basic premise of any role-playing game is to delve as deeply as possible into the psyche of its main characters. Most games let you carefully craft a party of characters, then pamper polish and protect them through outrageous adventures. Some fictional characters are programmed to develop such distinctive personalities that if they fall to harm's way, their human caretakers often react with the tense emotions. Computer role-playing games are natural extensions of their traditional pen and paper games or tabletop miniatures. Hardliners may complain that the real magic has been lost. For the rest of us, however, CRPGs are the realization of our dreams, or more often, our nightmares. The top 10 role-playing games. Number 1, Might and Magic, Clouds of Sea. Big and colorful, this one's an excellent choice for rookie role-players. I resent that uh, rookie remark, but I agree it's a fantastic game. <laughs> As I've said prior, if you think this game is easy, try a, a JRPG. Not to put JRPGs down, but you know, this is... Tons of people in the council world never will never give any of these games a proper shot because they look at them and they just die instantly and this is exactly this is the same as any of those other games that you view as hard you will die instantly when you have no clue what you are doing and it is a challenge throughout most of the game tons of stuff are challenging in this game you know and you will need your might and your magic it is being an intelligent person that allows you to turn a game into an easier one. It is, by definition, a difficult game, but it can be manipulated into being an easier one when you know what you're doing. Don't confuse the two. Don't call it easy when most people going to it are going to have a difficult time, and you got to explain these things correctly. If I just said, oh, this is an easy game, everybody play this, play this one because it's so easy, to all the newcomers, and they played this one, they would never, ever play another role-playing game, another CRPG, the rest of their entire lives. They would never get through this game if I just, oh, just go into it. It's, it's plenty easy. It's plenty intuitive. Just go through it. They will lose. So you got to you got to explain it right. Even if it's easier to you, you got to explain it right. So you got to say, yes, it is a more difficult game, but... I, I have faith in you. You can get through it. It's worth getting through. You're going to have fun if you uh, persevere through it and uh, show them how they can do it. That's how you get people to love games. And how much do you want to bet this guy calling it this, you know, a perfect game for rookies to, of role-playing games to play? How much do you want to bet that guy used the rookie mode, the adventurer mode, the easy mode of the game? Ten to one odds, that's what he used. And if a game has difficulty settings built in, you can never comment on a game and call it easy unless you play the most difficult setting and it's easy for you. Now, having said all of that, I would actually say that the difficulty in terms of other Might and Magic games, like this is the game to play first if you have never experienced, um, especially the classic Might and Magics, one through five. If you've never played any of those games and you're looking to get into one and you want to have you know, the best overall experience not knowing what you're getting into, might and Magic 4 is the one to start with, combined with Might and Magic 5, obviously. And this was the first of the classics I ever beat uh, back in the day, when we got Might and Magic 6. We got a special collection of them, which included 1 through 5, uh, with 6. 
Now, I beat six first and sixes. I don't know. You know, for modern people, they might be more attracted to the 3D games later on. Because I know there might magic factions out there, you know. They've only played the 3D ones. And then there are might magic people who have only played the classic ones. And some of them never get on board with all of them, like I am. So it would be difficult for me to, if you've never played any Might and Magic games at all, to recommend which one you should start with, because, you know, some certain people might want to start with one of the 3D games. But if you are looking to get into the classic style, then I would recommend four. Now, Might Magic 2 was the first Might Magic I ever played back on the Amiga, and I was thoroughly uh, impressed with that world and even started my very first hand mappings uh, back when I was playing Might Magic 2 on the Amiga, but you know, there, I don't feel there's any chance for somebody new coming to a Might and Magic game to beat Might and Magic 2. It's an extraordinarily difficult game. Uh, worth playing, definitely, y'all. Any Might and Magic fan, you can't call yourself a fan unless you give the first two the respect they deserve. And while you can fall in love with a franchise that you don't beat because it's too hard, you know, I, well, I definitely felt inspired by the second one back on the Amiga. It wasn't until, you know, my dad got the sixth one and I played through it and I got those accomplishments and failures and eventually I won the game. That, winning the game is the thing that uh, enthralls you about a game. It's winning, oh, I won, and then you want to, you know, search everything else out. That's after I won six. That's when I went back to uh, Might Magic 4 here, and I had I needed a little help with my dad for some of the puzzles in this one, but overall I did it by myself, and you know, this was the one I beat first of the classic ones, and then I went to five, beat that, and I had them all, you know, six came with all of the previous ones, so I was playing a little bit of all of them at that point, and this is the one that I was able, you know, to get a little bit into and then, you know, develop, want to beat it. That is a key factor in recommending uh, certain games to certain people. All of them are worth playing, but, uh, you know, even this style, Might Magic 3 has this same graphical style, same engine. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend people start with Might and Magic 3 because that is a more difficult game, to, especially the first town area. Uh, and if you can't even get out of the first town when you're playing a game, yeah, that's probably not the one to point people to because that could mean they never, never tr get anywhere with it. And they will never try out another one because they tried one and it was the wrong one for them personally to try. It's, they're all great games, but this is probably the one, if you don't love these games already and you want to give them a shot, number four. And that probably is because certain elements of it are, quote unquote, easier than uh, the other games. But uh, sometimes being easier is a good thing. And overall, it doesn't matter. Just because a certain game in a certain genre is easier doesn't mean, it, you know... The grand scheme of games, this is absolutely a difficult game. So you can't let your own little personal bubble of the games you like taint the overall perspective of games. And this is, it's more difficult. Know what you're getting into. It's worth getting into. Some of it is easier in terms of this style and this series. So go to this one first if you've never played the classic Might and Magics. But, uh... You will not, it will not be an easy ride for anybody coming to this game for the first time or RPGs uh, for the first time. From December of 1992, Computer Gaming World, which had an advertisement in one of its pages for uh, Clowns of Zine. This is a holiday buying guide for 1992, which shows that Might Magic 2, uh, despite most of the reviews coming out uh, in 1993, 
Uh, it did come out uh, late 1992. Might Magic, Clouds of Zine. Using the same basic point and click icon based CRPG engine as Might Magic 3, Clouds of Zine introduces a fascinating new villain in the evil Lord Zine. And perhaps one of the boldest design concepts in CRPGs to date, John Van Cannon conceived Zine as a two tiered world the world of brightness to be found in Clouds, and the world of darkness to be found in the sequel. Gamers who have both Clouds and its upcoming sequel on their hard drives will find that they can not only travel between the worlds of both games, but we'll find that they have different strengths and weaknesses in each game world, and that there is yet another quest, almost half the size of Clouds, to reward them for their success. New World, IBM 6995. Now I have a few sales charts to show you, and notice that this is different from previous ones I've shown in the past. Notice that this one does not have, you know, a warning that this is an advertisement, technically. Um, and that's just before. The, the ones I've shown you prior are like a billboard kind of a service. You know, billboard, you know, you can be the number one song on a billboard chart, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't some unknown that got played on the radio and sold a million records and technically might have sold a little more than the number one on a billboard chart. Highly unlikely, but doesn't mean it wasn't possible. So, but that's why the ones I've shown you in the past were technically uh, advertisements is because it was another company that was responsible for them. Here, it's Computer Gaming World basing it off of a list of actual units sold from software, etc. Babbage's, Walden Software, and Electronics Boutique. I forgot about Electronics Boutique. Uh, the one, the one I went to uh, was turned into a Babbage's eventually, and then that one was turned into a GameStop, and I never went there after that. Anyway, I do prefer this list because it actually has not only DOS software, but it separately lists Amiga software. And notice how the Amiga is right below the IBM PC, and then there's Macintosh below the Amiga. And they don't even list no Atari or anything else, okay? So, you know, you think Amiga didn't do anything in America? You are utterly, completely, ridiculously wrong on so many levels. And notice the types of games you see on that list for Amiga. And do you see anybody covering those types of games online today? Interesting. I'll be getting back to this list in another video, I'm sure. But for this uh, particular review, uh, number four on the PC MS-DOS list is Might & Magic Clouds of Zine, September 1992. From the very next month, October of 92, Might & Magic Clouds of Zine inches up to number three. From June of 1993, the Amiga still making this list. Oh, the Amiga was nothing in America. June of 1993, uh, Might Magic was still uh, number three on that list, so always, always up there. And in fact, sadly, uh, I, I, I didn't even want to show you guys, but uh, well into uh, 1996 and seven, uh, role-playing games would go on quite a downward spiral at this point in time. And I think it had a lot to do with what was being offered the new style. Uh, Mind Magic Clouds of Zine was really bucking the trend in 1992 to be making a turn-based RPG like this. It had stopped. It had already stopped. With Eye of the Beholder, a wonderful game, a wonderful game, but everything after Eye of the Beholder, all the RPGs started going towards a real-time combat type of a engine and um, I wonder if that didn't cause the death of RPGs in the mid 90s do you know how they advertised might and magic 6 they advertised it by saying some say that computer role-playing games are dead experience the rebirth of a legend I I'm telling you that because might and magic clouds of zine would continue to rate computer gaming's world's um, top of the readers likes and stuff uh, you know it's a different chart than this but um, it was like the only game like in 1995 1996 there were three games listed on the RPG section of the readers thing 
and every single other list was completely filled with games. RPGs had a bunch of blank ones there. <laughs> there were only three games listed in that time period, and Might and Magic Clouds of Zine was number one in 1996. From January of 1993, we're going to get the review from Scorpia. Hello, Scorpia. We made again. And since I haven't really gone into uh, the types of spells in this game, I'll let Scorpia do it for me. A new day in magic. Many of the old familiar spells from Terra are here, along with some new ones particularly welcome, are the Day of Sorcery for Mage Types and the Day of Protection for Cleric Types. These are packages that cast multiple spells at once. No longer is it necessary to cast individual heroism, holy bonus spells, or a mass of several elemental protection spells. Another new feature that is sure to bring cheers is the appearance of the Autonote Utility. The game automatically records for you all the important information and clues that you come across during play. This includes the locations of all those neat little wells, fountains that give temporary boost to stats, and shrines that provide daily protection against elemental powers, as well as the passwords, obscure hints, and whatnot that uh, turn up as you ramble around the world. There are, however, a couple of problems with the quests. One is the fact that you can find a quest item or complete a quest errand without having been set out to do the task. For instance, in Castle Psenji, I came across a scroll of insight which was clearly a quest item, and it was a long time after that before the party stumbled on the person who wanted it. It is unsettling and sometimes annoying to find yourself in these unknown quests. It would have been far better if the requisite items did not appear in the game until after the party had been commissioned to find them. I could not disagree more. This is my problem with Scorpia on the whole. Some people online today, this is their go-to for historical reference when it comes to RPGs. They instantly, the go-to person is, what does Scorpia have to say about this game? As if Scorpia spoke for the world. We'll get back to Scorpia, but first, uh, this little riddle. My first is in Giant, but not in Defiant. My second is in Mole, but not in Mew. My fifth is in Zine, but not in Queen. What is my name? Gullix, uh, I didn't show you all of the clues there, but that is a great gaming memory. One of my uh, fondest gaming memories is I came across all of those. It's really a rather simple uh, type of riddle, but I was a kid. You know, I was um, you know eleven or twelve or something. I, I I just I wrote them all down, completely puzzled. I I think I did. I don't know, I put something, anyway, I took it to my dad, who was downstairs, and I said, can you help me with this, and a great memory with this was, I remember him looking at it, like, at first he looked a little annoyed, but then he actually saw it, and then he was like, hmm, he's like, oh, I like, I like, what's this here, I like this, and, but the thing about it was, that he not only solved it for me, which he did, thankfully, but he told me, took me aside, and said, this is how you do it, this is what it's getting at, you know, my first is in mole, but not in mule, or whatever he is. What's the difference there? All of the other letters are the same. One letter is different. Pick out the letter that's different. You add them together with the other ones, you get your answer. And I forever have that picture in my mind of my dad, who looked, looked annoyed originally, but then he was very pleased when he was starting to read this, because he had a clue, but he didn't quite, it took him like, I don't know, 10 or 15 Asshole. minutes or something. He didn't instantly know it, but he figured it out quite quickly. It's it's those little things, like people think, oh, it's so, e so easy, so easy, but it's not really, when you are presented with a, you know, out of nowhere kind of riddle like that, you are like stumped at first, like, what, where the heck is this coming from? But when you are able, like, you know, it doesn't take that long, to, you know, it's not something that stops the gameplay completely for somebody who's smart, but it's, nor is it even if you are smart, you don't instantly get that if you've never even experienced that type of a question before, but you figure it out and those things add to the enjoyment of the game for me. And a wonderful uh, forever gaming memory. Now back to Scorpia who thinks that collecting an item prior to actually being assigned the quest is unsettling and annoying. It's these types of comments from her which make me say, 
You know what? She is worth, you know, discussing. I like when I see something from Scorpia. But I would never put her as the go-to because she has these... Not only do I fundamentally disagree with that statement, I think oh, I, I think the majority of game players disagreed with quite a few of her quite bombastic statements. What a coincidence that I happened across somebody, you know, that right before I met them, they just lost this thing that is so important to them. They just lost it. They just lost it. And, you know, somebody ran away with it to this other location. So now go and get it, even though I've already been there before. And presumably, whatever is so important to them, yeah, presumably, they, they didn't just lose it the instant I stop, stepped foot at their residence, did they? No, it's it's already out there. They've been having the problem for a while. That makes a load more sense, that you can come across this world. The items are there. You don't know. You oftentimes in life come across something that you don't realize is important when you find it. I think it's a hell of a lot more frustrating to have already been to an area completely conquered it and then later on you, you think it's a useless area but then later on you bump into somebody that says oh guess what I lost something at this area that you've already been to and then you show up and nobody's there anymore because you've already killed everything there but the item has magically appeared there that is a million times more giant and I think the majority of gamers would agree with me there and there's just no shortage of those types of comments from Scorpio, which are definitely worth reading. She was probably the longest running editor at that magazine. I think that's for a reason. I think she realized that, you know, you poke a few buttons here and there and you get a response. And while that may get your name out there, I don't think that necessarily means that she spoke for the fans of the RPG genre. Some more from Scorpio. There isn't much plot to Clouds of Zine. Your job is the straightforward task of building up a party, finding where Zine layers, and then going there to kill him. This marks a departure from the previous games, where the ultimate goal was not to engage in a fuzzle fight, but to do some other non-violent action. In the case of Zine, it goes this way. If you have the right item, Zine is toast. If you don't have it, your party is toast. I agree with the uh, criticism there, but we'll get to that later. For all that, Clouds of Zine is likely, particularly with the new features, to please the hardcore Might and Magic fans, and thanks to Adventure Mode, some who might otherwise pass the game by. From March of 1993, Dragon Magazine. Soar amongst the clouds of Zine. Receiving five out of five stars, and what a delightful experience. Clouds of Zine gets back to the root of fantasy role-playing games. It is eloquent in its simplicity and exciting in its delivery, while full of interesting and dangerous adventure. We've been playing Zine for over a week, for at least three to four hours a night. We hate to leave it to do other things. At every turn, there is a new encounter to manage, a new quest to complete, or a puzzle to solve. This is a great FRPG. The animation, although limited, is appropriate, and the number of exciting quests will keep you playing for days. Welcome to Shanger Live, everybody. We found it. <laughs> uh, this is one of those areas where you really it's hidden. It's quite well hidden in the uh, upper right area, the volcano. You don't have any quests or anything to go find this. So the only way for you to find it is for you to go off exploring by yourself, which I don't think I found this originally in my original playthrough as a kid. But probably by the second or third time I played it, I'm sure I probably uh, got over there. Let's show you a little bit of the map here. We are now in Shangri-La, which is buried deep below Mount Firestone on the upper right in this area. It's you know, not very friendly, and there's lots of lava and uh, lots of monsters over there. So most people are probably unlikely to uh, venture out into that area originally. It's a huge, a massive world out there, although technically I don't think it's actually any bigger than the original Might Magic 1, 2, or 3. It's still Oops. within the same you know, you know, mathematical area, but it's still it's a massive, huge area nonetheless. So for a game that is titled Clouds of Zine, finally let's say hello to the clouds of Zine. Originally when I played this, I, I forgot that it's each individual tower has its own cloud area. I was thinking of the sequel, uh, 
Might Magic 5 dark side of Zine, which each, the whole cloud area of the entire world is connected to each other. So actually, some of these areas I should have went to uh, much earlier on, but I didn't. You know, the game is extraordinary, not linear, so you can go you know, do whatever you want, go wherever you want. From the beginning of the game, you know, it's going to get you slaughtered most likely, but uh, I, these, you know, King's Mega Credits, I, you know, it took me to the end of the game, and that's why I was finding these areas like Shangri-La and stuff. I was finding them very early because I couldn't find the Mega Credits. I had missed a couple of them earlier on, so in order to uh, build my castle here, I, I was stumbling a bit, but yeah, this is... You know, the main story arc is here. We found Croto earlier on. That was the first time, really, that we saw any actual mainline story. And then we got to find these credits to build a castle for ourselves, which is wonderful. It's wonderful to have a castle in your honor in one of these RPGs. We're that important. Finally, in a game, we're important enough to write our own castle. And our goal, eventually, is to get into the basement area to uh, get this uh, super weapon that we need to defeat Lord Zine. But in order to do that, we have to clear out the ground a little bit first. We gotta build up the second floor a little bit, and then finally we clear out the basement. So, you know, it it takes a little bit. And each time we do one of these things, we get a little key or a stone to another one of these little dungeon areas where we get to uh, face some more enemies, find more of these king's uh, mega credits to build our castle. We're building things up like we build our party up throughout most of the adventure. I really like this uh, final aspect of this game here. I haven't talked about the economy yet, but the economy in this game is amongst the best, probably the best, uh, of any RPG. Um, constantly in this game, you know, you are running out of money, you're using your money to upgrade your equipment. The, you know, the, the stores in this game can have valuable equipment up until the end of the game for you now, of course, the best stuff you're going to find while you are out questing and uh, defeating enemies and stuff. And a lot of the greatest items are, you know, randomly generated in the chests. But it doesn't matter. You will still be finding good stuff to buy. Your, your money will still be somewhat low. You're not going to become super rich in this game because the training and stuff, all that stuff, in, you know, the cost of the training is going to continue to increase as you were to see... Uh, very soon here as I enter the training and uh, as I train the gold even in this very end of the game here. It's going to go down and down and by the time they're all trained I'm not going to have that much money and the spells, everything in this game costs lots of money. The money is kept tight in this game but you're not broke either. So, you know, you get money, you spend it on things, but you don't become filthy rich to where you forget about it. It's a wonderfully, equally balanced system. Great economy. Now as the game is going to show you some of the more interesting puzzles, we are going to take a look at PC Games from January of 1993. Sometimes 4 doesn't come after 3. Might Magic 3 isn't followed by 4, as you'd expect, but by Clouds of Zine. Not only does that mess up New World's numbering system, but it might mess up your head, too. This new adventure, and I do mean new, doesn't depend on foiling the plans of Sheltam, as do the first three Might Magic role-playing games, but instead starts you on a whole new quest in the world of Zine. And while Might Magic 3 Hours of Terror was, in many ways, head and shoulders above the competition, Zine is but another well-made role-playing game that breaks little new ground. Even so, Zine's filled with many of the amenities of good role-playing. Zine eschews the trend toward real-time combat. Although the animation suggests that action takes place as you watch, it's really turn-based. Combat is a simple affair, and you can fight, block, use an item, cast a spell, or run. All combat effects are animated with flying arrows and crackling lightning bolts. This kind of combat system seems to lack the tactical complexity of something such as Micropro's Darklands, but it's adequate. Although Zine isn't breathtaking, spectacular, or groundbreaking, a comment on the general high quality of Zine's competition, not a knock on New World, it provides generous amounts of entertainment to gamers looking for some old-fashioned fantasy role-playing built around a solid game engine. And after Zine, New World will take a stab at an Ultima Underworld-style 3D engine. Reality catches up to everyone, even fantasy role-playing designers. Incorrect! They would instead go back to uh, King's Bounty, uh, create a sequel for that game, call it Heroes of Might and Magic, and uh, 
create a couple of those eventually they would create a might and magic 6 which did have a nice 3d engine at the time but they did stick they stuck with their guns with the turn-based stuff and although you could fight might and magic 6 and the 3d might and magics you could fight them in real-time mode there was always an option and most i think most players probably preferred the option of turning it into turn-based. I do feel the uh, decision to stick with turn-based not only helped the Might and Magic series eventually when it, it went 3D, but it also really got those Heroes of Might and Magic games to just completely outsell their competition of strategy games which had all gone uh, to real-time combat at that point. Yeah, I respect real-time combat types of games, but I do not I do not respect companies that decide that one thing is now, you know, it's obsolete. The, the past is completely obsolete. So this turn-based thing, which everybody loved for so long, is now completely obsolete because we went to this new thing. I do not respect companies that go with that line of thinking. So now as we enter the final end game area in Zine's Castle, we're going to see the first examples in this game of a science fiction element, something which always you know, pops its head up in the, all of the Might and Magic games prior to this and after this, mostly. This is the only uh, part of the game with any kind of a science fiction element because we are not in that uh, Sheltam Korak uh, story in this particular game, although they, they will become more relevant in the next game. In the Might Magic universe, there was a very technical race that created all of these different worlds. But the world, their communication got lost, so they kind of went back, reverted to an earlier time, kind of like, you know, went back to the medieval ages there. That's uh, the universe we are in. But, you know, there is that science fiction element that pops its head up once in a while, which I absolutely adore from these games. Now, My Magic 4 at the time was, you know, either thought of as wonderful, great, again, it made the, you know, best RPG of the year there, or it was thought of as quite competent, but maybe not as good as some of its competition at the time, but nobody, nobody really disliked it. All of that kind of, you know, maybe it's huh. not so good kind of feeling would completely disappear with the arrival of Might and Magic 5. When people finally had Dark Side of Zine in their hands, even though New World was telling everybody this, at the release of Might and Magic 4, I don't know if they quite understood or grasped what they were actually saying. I think they may have just thought it was some kind of a little add-on or something. You no, know, Might and Magic 5 is a complete full game, plus it adds a half a game on top of that. When they actually got them together and they played it, the respect for Might and Magic 4 completely went way up. When combined with 5, they looked at it in a whole new light. Here is Zine completely destroying us because we did not have that Zine Slayer sword equipped. But we're going to equip it now and we're going to make relatively uh, short work with him. I remember the first time I played this though because my characters weren't as buff. I do believe a couple of my characters were eradicated originally because it's, it's not just that the sword will kill him instantly. That doesn't, it depends on your attributes, the one that is holding the sword. So he actually goes through a couple swings here and if my character was even weaker, you know, he might have been able to kill a couple people there. So it's not quite like Scorpius says, either you don't have the sword and you're slaughtered, or you do have the sword and, you know, it's one swing. You know, it can be that, but also, it, it, you know, it depends on what you've done with your characters and what mode, what e if you're on easy mode or not, I, I'm pretty sure. You know, but in essence, her criticism is absolutely valid because, you know, the previous Might and Magic games, you know, they, they didn't involve you know, a final boss battle of such, you know, they had some kind of a puzzle or something at the end. A Might Magic 5, it, you know, it would be a non-violent kind of ending. It wouldn't be until Might Magic 6 when they finally had a final boss battle that was pretty well done. 
And the, they would go back and forth, even in the 3D series. I don't think Might Magic, Might Magic 7 had a non-violent ending, I believe. So it's kind of a letdown in terms of that final boss fight there. But again, we are going to another land very soon on here. As uh, this guy here is uh, telling us, we'll learn more about him. In the dark side of Z. <laughs> So final thoughts on Might Magic 4, Clouds of Zine. Certainly a favorite of mine, the first of the classic Might and Magic games that I managed to defeat as a kid. I would fully recommend people who have never played the classic Might and Magic games, you know, start with this one. It'd be a fabulous choice. You know, while the main storyline takes a hell of a long time to pick up in this game, and even when it does, it's, it's not the greatest in terms of the Bite Magic games. It's the side questing stories that, you know, you really get a sense of the people that inhabit the lands through the multitude of side quests. Wonderful, probably the best Might Magic game in terms of the side quests. Now, the end game sequence that you're seeing here, probably one of the most boring ones, it goes on for a good 10 minutes of just every single enemy you faced in the entire game. Wow, is that a boring thing to watch. But we will get our final score. Now, the game has a fabulous economy, a plethora of interesting spells to cast, and look at that wonderful score right there. We can send it to the ancient headquarters, which is New World Computing, which I don't, I don't think they'd answer me anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't think they'd uh, respond to me. Do you think? You know, Richard Gary at Ultima actually still responds to this day. If you send him, you know, an end screen or high score kind of thing, he will actually respond to you and say thank you and everything, congratulate you. You think uh, John Van Canham would do that? I don't think John Van Canham is like on the uh, social networks to do that, but uh, kind of cool that uh, Lord British does that kind of stuff still. And of course, once Might Magic 4 is complete, well, it's not really complete. Again, uh, take your party, load up that game again, you will start in Vertigo and you will be, you know, placed perfectly to uh, enter that little pyramid that is just outside of, of uh, Vertigo and uh, start your new quest in the dark side, which is going to have some excellent music. I didn't talk about the music. The music in this game is okay. And despite having a Roland MT-32, I actually went with the Sound Blaster support because it's OPL-3 instead of OPL-2, so it's actually nice FM music. But, and uh, the Roland MT-32 wasn't intelligent mode, so it didn't have any sound effects, so I'd actually say the Sound Blaster support is the best. But Might Magic 4 in particular only had a couple of memorable songs, especially the character creation screen. Might Magic 5 has a whole ton of other ones, including the one that you're hearing now in the background. So it gets better, but Might Magic 4 itself isn't the greatest with the music, if you ask me. But let's point you to some other reviews. Again, I've already covered Might Magic 3 Isles of Terror on the Amiga. Check that one out. Uh, last RPG I did was uh, Champions of Kryn, I believe, for the Amiga. Wonderful gold box game. I have also done a Pool of Radiance. And also check out uh, King's Bounty, the precursor to uh, the Heroes of Might and Magic series. Hope you all enjoyed this video. Check out my written review at shot97retro.blogspot.com. See you all later. Bye.